Today on the Matt Wall Show, one of the worst examples of sexual grooming of children at a public school is exposed. We'll talk about that. Plus, Biden warns of the coming winter of death, and a Pentagon official says that murdering innocent children is a learning experience for the Biden administration. And people continue to beat the hell out of each other at airports, which is apparently not against the rules, I guess. And an MSNBC host valiantly defends the right of black people to use racial slurs against white people. And also, me and my people fall victim to cultural appropriation. And it doesn't feel very good, I have to say. We'll talk about all of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. And now a word from one of my favorite sponsors, Moink Box. Uh, look, they've got a lot of great, delicious meat, uh, Moink does, but uh, probably my personal favorite is their bacon. If you could see and taste this bacon from moinkbox.com, you would order it right now. But for now, um, it's all, all I can tell you, just I'll have to inform you, have to take my word for it, that it's delicious. And uh, that's why you've got to get moinkbox.com. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and wild-caught Alaskan salmon directly to your door helping family farms become financially independent outside of big agriculture. Their animals are raised outdoors, their fish swim wild in the ocean, and moink meat is free of antibiotics, hormones, sugar, and all the other junk you find prepackaged in the meat aisle. Sign up at moinkbox.com show, and uh, you'll get a year of ground beef for free, and uh, and then pick what meat what meats you want delivered with your first box. Change what you, what you get each month and cancel anytime. Moink was founded by eighth-generation farmers who uh, were also featured on Shark Tank, and all you got to do is join the Moink movement today. Go to moinkbox.com slash Walsh right now. Listeners to this show get free ground beef for a year. That's one year of the best ground beef you'll ever taste. But for a limited time, spelled M-O-I-N-K box.com slash Walsh. That's moinkbox.com slash Walsh. The trouble with trying to do an episode of this show where I discuss the worst recent example of left, left-wing lunacy in the public school system is that the worst recent example is always so quickly one-upped by something even more egregious For example, I had planned to spend some time reflecting today on this. A school in uh, Denver, Centennial Elementary, advertised Families of Color Playground Night. And they were going to hold, essentially, a racially segregated recess. As the struggle for equity brings us every day closer and closer to separate drinking fountains again. In fact, the only reason there aren't already separate drinking fountains is that drinking fountains have all been turned off because of COVID. Otherwise, I think we'd probably have crossed that boundary line months ago. Of course, the corporate media had to do what it could do to uh, to run cover for the bigots over at Centennial Elementary. And so Reuters today ran a fact check claiming that all of the outrage over this was uh, misguided. The article says, A Denver elementary school has defended its decision to display a sign for a playground night for families of color after social media users accused it of racial segregation. No, well, social media users did not accuse it of racial segregation. That's like saying that I accuse water of being wet. Families of color playground night is racial segregation by definition. You are holding an event specially designed for certain races and not others. Unless we're expanding people of color to include everyone, which we should, by the way, because every person is a person of color. If my skin had no color, you know, I know I'm pretty pale, but, but if I had no color at all, I would be translucent, like some kind of jellyfish or amoeba or maybe Casper the ghost. But I am neither a deep sea creature nor an undead spirit. And thus I have color in my skin like anybody else. But I don't think that the organizers of Families of Color Playground Night had that in mind exactly. So the fact check continues. The school said on its website, over the years, we have had several family nights with an equity theme where families can come together to learn and talk about diversity and inclusivity in service of of equity. Some of these families shared with us that since the only time many of them see one another is at drop-off and pickup times, we host some events where black and Latinx Latinx families can meet one another, connect with one another, and share their experiences about the school with one another. They continued, we are honoring their request. All families are welcome to attend all of our events, and families from a variety of backgrounds have done so. Ah, so that's how Reuters gets away with pretending that this is a fact check of a fake news story. Because after the fact, the school claimed that technically anyone, even the dirty white devils, could attend the event if they wanted to. Well, of course they could physically attend the event if they wanted to. The school can't legally prevent them. But the point is that they're not welcome. The event is not for them if they're white. It's for members of, I guess, superior races. Who the school says, these superior races, need special events so that they can meet each other. 
why they can't meet each other on their own or at normal school functions designed for everybody. When I was a kid, we had uh, in elementary school, we had ice cream socials where everybody could come and you can meet anybody you want. So why they can't do that is not explained. Now, that was all bad enough. But as I said, it has been usurped, beaten in the contest for most deranged public school incident this week by events at Buena Vista Middle School in California. The Daily Wire has the story. It says, in October, a shocking report claimed that teachers at, uh, at uh, a uh, Salinas, California middle school secretly recruited students into a pro-LGBT club disgui- disguised as a gender equality club without their parents knowing. In the club, teachers reportedly indoctrinated the pupils into accepting progressive teachings on sexuality and transgender ideology, even going so far as to coach students into changing their gender while advising them on how to hide their new identity from their parents. At least one couple who said they were parents of a student claimed they were called into Buena Vista uh, Middle School, where a teacher told them that their 12-year-old daughter was now a boy. According to the father, when they refused to use the daughter's preferred pronouns, the teacher called the public safety officer to the meeting. On Tuesday night, they were able to address these teachers for the first time at a local school board meeting. The unnamed mother excoriated the teachers for allegedly changing her daughter's name, using different gender pronouns, and altering key school accounts without her knowledge while helping the daughter transition into a boy. Now, we have some of that speech um, from the mother, whose name actually is Jessica, by the way, and let's listen to that. Let these teachers come in and act as if they have nothing wrong. They've done nothing wrong. A mistake? How long of a mistake? How many mistakes are we going to take before my child almost lost her life? They didn't tell me that my child was suicidal. You allowed these teachers to open their classrooms teaching predatorial information to a young child, a mindful child that doesn't even know how to comprehend it all. How do you not know what was going on on your own campuses? Did you think that no parent would ever come forward? You will not quiet me today. I will stand here today and protect my child along with every other child who has not come forward yet. Do you, do you, do they have psychiatry degrees that I was unaware of? Because I didn't hire them. Okay, I did not hire them to sit there and nitpick my child's brain. You took away my ability to parent my child. Even before I had any knowledge. I didn't even get to show support. You asked for support, I didn't get a chance. You planted seeds, Ms. Caldera, and Ms. Baraki, Mr. Baraki, and you, Ms. Tagarin. Your job was to educate my child in math, science, English, etc. Do your job and let me do mine. Now, we're so used to hearing uh, performative outrage that it can be jarring almost to hear true righteous outrage. But that's what that sounds like, because that was no performance. This was desperation and fury from a mother who was trying to rescue her daughter. The Epoch Times has a little more on this story. It says, two teachers at Buena Vista Middle School in Salinas were recorded coaching other teachers to conceal the nature of LGBTQ clubs from parents at a sold-out California Teachers Association conference held in Palm Springs, California from October 29th to October 31st. So this was before. So this is backing up a little bit. This is before the incident with the daughter and before this meeting, which was this week. Uh, so going back in October, there was a meeting of teachers where they were where they were being coached on how exactly to coach the kids. The CTA event was billed as the 2021 LGBTQ plus issues conference beyond the binary identity and imagining possibilities. Jessica Conan, who's the mother, claims that one of her daughter's teachers then coaxed her daughter to join a lunch hour equality club and began affirming her daughter as transgender. Near the end of sixth grade, Conan's daughter told her she might be bisexual, and by the middle of seventh grade, Conan was called to the school for this meeting with her daughter, a teacher, and the school principal. The teacher told Conan her daughter was trans-fluid. Uh, Jessica said, I sat across the table and I was crying. I was trying to absorb everything. They kept looking at me angrily because I kept saying she, and uh, that it was going to take me time to process everything, she said. I was very confused. I was very upset. I was blindsided, completely blindsided. The teacher accused Conan of not being emotionally supportive of her daughter, who was to be called by a new name and male pronouns, and would be using the unisex restroom at school. I felt she completely coached my child, Conan said. So this is the, the school informing the parents that their child has a brand new identity, which the school has uh, assisted, helpfully, assisted the child in informing. 
your child that you thought you knew is dead. And uh, now you have a son and here's his name. And this is what you're going to call him. That's what the school's doing. Now, Mrs. Conan says that she feels like her daughter was coached and she was coached. But I think coaching is, is, is not exactly the right word because coaching is what you do on the sidelines of a football game. Coaching happens in workplaces. Parents coach their children. But when strange adults impose their sexual ideas onto pubescent children and attempt to coax them into a certain sexual lifestyle, that's what we call grooming. This mother sounds utterly traumatized because she is traumatized. Her daughter is a sexual abuse victim. And she had to sit in the room with her daughter's sexual abusers and be lectured by them. Imagine that. Your child is sexually abused, and then you get called into a meeting with your child's abusers, and they lecture you, and then call the police on you. Her daughter, of course, is even more traumatized as the primary victim here, and the one whose mind and life and self-perception are at stake. So this is grooming. This is sexual abuse. And it's done by degenerate perverts, many of whom get a sexual thrill out of having these intensely sexual conversations with children. And we know that's the case because the public school system, as I've pointed out many times, is utterly littered with sex predators. It's probably time we stop pretending that the explosion of sex assault and pedophilia in the school system is somehow disconnected from this sort of psychological grooming. But there's another word that um, could be used too, I think, and that is abduction. So the schools here are, are not only grooming children and abusing them, but also committing a form of kidnapping. They are, in a very real sense, trying to steal children away from their parents. They want to abduct the child, the one that you know, your child, the one you raised, and replace him with somebody else. I mean, they're literally trying to make a new child with a new name and everything. It's not so much the traditional form of kidnapping as it is a kind of invasion of the body snatchers technique. But the effect is much the same. And morally speaking, the kidnappers and abusers in the school system aren't much different from the predator in a van prowling the neighborhood. They deserve to be treated with the same contempt and hostility. And we have to protect our children from them just the same. Now let's get to our five headlines. So uh, we'll start here. The Pentagon recently announced that nobody would be held responsible for or punished for the, uh, the drone strike in Afghanistan that wiped an entire Afghan family off the map, including, uh, I believe it was seven children that were, that were killed. And you remember this. We, we heard first about a drone strike, and they said that uh, this is a, a brilliant uh, strategic maneuver by our military, and they, they were able to take out some very dangerous terrorists who were, uh, they, they, they were on their way. In fact, I think that was the, the original story, if I remember correctly, was that the terrorists were, in that moment, on their way to go blow themselves up somewhere and kill a bunch of people. So um, by, through this drone strike, they, they had saved, the Biden administration had saved countless lives, hundreds of lives, perhaps. That was the original story. And then, um, and then some questions started arising about that story. It seems a little bit strange. And then, and then finally, they said, oh, you know what? <laughs> Our bad. A little bit of a screw up there. Yeah, we, uh, we, we, we killed an entire family. Then they were totally innocent. They weren't doing anything wrong. Now, an official from the Pentagon was on MSNBC yesterday to talk about this, and especially to defend the decision by the Pentagon, which was uh, announced this week also, that nobody is going to be punished for this. Nobody's going to be held accountable. Um, but he says, it is, uh, it, we'll learn from it. Let's listen. How does it strike you that no one is held accountable? Because I know how it strikes a lot of people around the I world do. that you can get away with murder and nobody's punished for it. I do understand that. We, we, we appreciate that not everybody's going to uh, support this decision. Uh, what I can tell you is we looked at this thing very, very comprehensively. And again, we acknowledge that there were procedural breakdowns. Processes were not uh, executed the way they should have been. But it doesn't necessarily indicate that, uh, that an individual or individuals have to be held to account for that. But look, uh, is there, this is, is one... There Discipline inside the Pentagon at all? I mean, maybe there are no charges brought up, but is anyone demoted or disciplined for what happened that what day? We're, what we are going to do, there's, no, there's not going to be 
individual discipline as a result of this, Willie. But what we are going to do is learn from this, uh, and we're going to enact and improve our procedures and our processes to try to make sure this doesn't happen again. My God, these, these sociopaths. I mean, this, you talk about the banality of evil. Is that guy right there, Kirby, I think that is. You know, talking about it, I, I wouldn't even accept that tone and that sort of language from somebody if they, you know, uh, bumped into my car in a parking lot and scratched the, 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 the bumper of my car. They said, you know, uh, we don't need to hold anyone accountable for this, but yeah, we'll learn from it. I, I, I promise that I'll, who knows really who's responsible for this anyway. It's, the procedures and processes went awry, and uh, well, but this is a learning experience. I wouldn't accept it under those circumstances. But we're not talking about a scratched bumper. We're talking about a vehicle that was blown up with children inside. And what we're told is that it's nobody's fault. It's a, it's a thing that happened. It's nobody's fault. And it's a learning experience. He actually said that in so many words. It's a learning experience to kill children. That's how the Biden administration looks at it. I promise we'll learn from it. We'll all be better. We'll all, we'll all be better off in the end after this experience. I mean, not the family that we wiped off the face of the earth, erased an entire bloodline. Uh, they're not going to be better off because they don't exist. But, uh, you know, we, we, we'll be better. This is what you get with bureaucracy, um, especially a bureaucracy run by soulless empty sociopaths, which really, in the end, they all will be, and they all are. But uh, this is what you get a bureaucracy. Th things happen, and nobody is responsible for them. Things occur, processes are followed, procedures are enacted, and no individual is responsible for doing it. So the bureaucracy becomes like this, itself, this giant organism. And you can blame the entire thing, but you cannot pinpoint one individual within that system and blame them. And it's designed this way. That's why the bureaucracy exists, is so that nobody within it can be blamed for anything. A bureaucracy is one giant deflection mechanism so that nobody is responsible for anything that happens, even when people die, especially when people die. So this is like the, the much, much worse... A deadly version of the frustration you feel. You know, think about think about when you, uh, you you have a problem with your internet or something, and you have to call your internet service provider, or you got to call Comcast or whatever. And um, and finding, especially if a mistake was made somewhere along along the line, if you're suffering at the end of some line of uh, incompetence and a mistake was made, and you're trying to find out who made the mistake and how we can rectify it, it's this total feeling of impotence and helplessness as you're sitting there on the phone and cycling through one person after another and nobody knows why it happened or what happened. Nobody's responsible for it. No one is, is uh, taking responsibility. Everyone is offering sort of these generic, generalized apologies, but not accepting responsibility for it. And you're just cycled through one person to the another, to the next, and no one can fix the problem, right? And again, it's, it's designed that way. Um, but that's how our government works. And in this case, the stakes are a lot higher than your internet wa not working. Really outrageous. Uh, meanwhile, staying in the Biden administration, the guy at the top, the guy ostensibly, supposedly at the top of it, Joe Biden himself, he had some uh, good, and, hope good and, and hopeful news as we head into the holiday. Let's listen to him. It's here now, and it's spreading, and it's going to increase. For unvaccinated, we are looking at a winter of severe illness, and death for unvaccinated, for themselves, their families, and the hospital, they'll soon overwhelm. Yeah, um, a winter of, uh, of death. A winter of death is upon us, he says. So, Merry Christmas. Um, a couple things about that. First of all, you, you, know, you should know that every winter is a winter of death. Uh, people die every winter. They die every season. They die every day. Um, death is... Uh, is a part of life, unfortunately, and that is that is something we have to remind ourselves of because it, it seems like the kind of thing you wouldn't you would it doesn't need to be said, but it, it does seem as though many people for, for many people they had never thought about this fact prior to COVID. 
Um, but let me just su suggest a strategy as we get into the holidays, we get into Christmas, and uh, if you're worried about COVID and everything, and he here's the strategy for COVID, okay? You, you live your life, and then if you get COVID or someone in your family gets COVID, then you, you deal with it in the moment. Okay, this, this very much has to be, if you, want to, if you want to live a functional, if you want to be a functional human being, living a life, living your life, living any kind of life, then this is the only way to go about it. Because COVID is with us forever, it's never going away. So um, you have to adopt a, we will cross that bridge when we come to it mentality. And you will come to the bridge eventually, but there's no reason to sit around every day trembling in fear about when you're going to stumble across this bridge. It'll happen when it happens, and it will happen. It'll happen multiple times, I hate to say. So it's not even like everyone is going to have a COVID experience, and then that'll be it. Same with the flu. You know, if you got the flu five years ago, you can't say, say well, I had my flu. You can get it again this year. You can get it 10 years from now. You could get it and die of it. Could happen, probably won't, but it could. So you're going to have multiple encounters with COVID throughout your life, just like you'll have multiple encounters with, uh, with many unfortunate things, um, many dangerous things, many of them more dangerous than COVID. And you live your life, and then when it happens, you, you deal with it. You stay home. You know, you try to, uh, of course, you try to isolate yourself from other people, just like you should with any sickness. And then you get through that, and then you go back to living your life. That's how you deal with it. Especially as the more we hear about this Omicron variant, which our public health officials and the Biden administration, they're treating Omicron or, uh, or Omnicorn as th the greatest threat we've yet faced. And uh, they're talking about reinstating lockdowns. And now we need, we might need vaccine passports for domestic travel. We might have you know, all these kinds of drastic measures might have to be put in place because of Omnicorn. Well, Everything we know about Omnicorn is that it's, first of all, about, I think it's like 70 times more infectious than Delta. And Delta was far more infectious than the original COVID strain. I think Delta was twice or three times as infectious. And this is 70 times more infectious than that. What does that mean? If the, if the data holds up, and this is all true, and, we have, and, and, and the sample size at this point is pretty large, so I think we could probably trust the data. That means that it, it, a respiratory illness that is that infectious, you are not going to avoid it. You will get it. You can, it cannot be avoided. The only way to maybe avoid it for a time is just to stay locked in your house. But even that isn't going to be a permanent solution. So you will absolutely encounter this probably pretty soon. But here's the good news is that it's very, very mild. Again, according to all the data that we have, even though it's 70 X, you know, in terms of of, uh, of, of how it spreads, of transmissibility, it's much, there, there are far fewer people dying of it than died of Delta. So a lot more people are getting it, but a lot fewer people are dying from it. And uh, we, it also seems, seems, again, I have, to keep, I have to keep qualifying this according to the data. Okay, so I'm just telling you what the data says, what the scientists are saying. And according to that, um, a great many of these cases probably are, uh, are there are no symptoms at all, are, are, are totally asymptomatic. So the good news is that, the bad news is that you're going to get Omnicorn if you haven't already. Uh, you're definitely going to get it. Definitely. Good news, and it's really good news, is that uh, you might not even know when you get it. Or you might know because you have the sniffles for a few days. Pretty good chance of that. So this would seem to me like uh, the end game for COVID. Not the end game in that it's going to go away because it's not ever going to go away. But the end game for this particular phase, getting us to a new stage where COVID is something that is, you know, that even the most paranoid among us could live with. Where it's just a really mild illness for most people and uh, it cycles through in seasons and people get it and they're, and they're fine and then that's it. That's what it seems to me. If this becomes the dominant strain, that's a good thing. And yet, 
public health officials, Biden administration, they are treating this like, you know, we got to go into DEFCON 1 here. This is, this is the worst possible thing. Is DEFCON 1 the worst or is it? Anyway, forget about that analogy. They're treating it like this is an urgent matter. What does that tell you? Does it possibly indicate that the people in charge of the people who have promised to shut down the virus have intentions that are quite the opposite of that? Maybe it indicates that. All right. Dr. Oz is running for Senate in Pennsylvania for some reason, even though he uh, doesn't live there. And he's running as a Republican. But here's what he had to say on the issue of life. And by the way, if you're running as a Republican and you're going on Fox News, as he did, you would think at least you'd be prepared for the question about abortion and the issue of when life begins. Especially with everything happening at the Supreme Court right now and the Texas law. So this is very much at the forefront of the national conversation, as we call it. So you'd think you'd be prepared for this question. You, you would have some kind of answer, even if it's not a good one. But uh, Dr. Oz appears to be not prepared at all for this question. Let's listen. What is your position as both a doctor and a senatorial candidate on when life begins? When should we draw the line when abortion is is legal? As a doctor, I appreciate the sanctity of life. And for that reason, I'm strongly pro-life. With the three exceptions I've mentioned, that's how I would vote. And when does that life begin? You know, again, if I'm pro-life, then it's a decision that com- comes back to the sanctity of when you think life does begin. And I believe it begins when it, you're in the mother's womb. When you're in the mother's womb? But that, that carries you all the way up to nine months of pregnancy. No, of course not. Life's already started when you're in your mother's womb. But, but it's a rat hole to get trapped in the different ways of talking about it. You, we need, as a nation, to make sure the Constitution is appropriately followed. And people like me, and you may be in the same camp, who are pro-life, have our feelings respected. And this is something that should not be taken away from us by judiciary legislating from the bench. Yeah, but that's also something that's going to have to be legislated. And that answer is going to have to be given specifically. This is, uh, it, it, this is always frustrating because you're, you're almost there. And I don't, Republicans often struggle with this. You're almost there. Just t- take it the rest of the way. I'm not even sure what you're afraid of at this point. I mean, I know there are plenty of cowardly Republicans who are afraid to even identify as pro-life in the first place and try to equivocate around that. Um, but once you have decided to dive into that pool and you're calling yourself pro-life, okay, great. Uh, even even with the uh, absurd compromises, oh, well, I'm, I'm pro-life in, 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 except for three cases. The, th- the three cases he mentioned, which those are not in the clip, but I assume the three cl- cases are rape, incest, life of the mother, because those are the exceptions that you always hear, uh, which, which we'll leave that aside mostly. That, that doesn't make any sense because if, you're, if you are against abortion, which means that you affirm the sanctity of life, as he says he does, and that, that, that children have the right to life, if that's what you believe, which you must believe because you're pro-life, then it doesn't make any sense to suspend that, um, even in cases where conception happens under these, um, you know, tragic circumstances. But he's already gone there, and then he's asked, well, when does life begin? And, and he says, uh, it begins in the womb. Well, yeah, but where, where, at what point in the womb? It's a really important question. He doesn't want to answer that, so he's dancing around it. Why? You're, you're already in it. You're in the pool now with pro-lifers. So if you're worried about what the left's going to say, what the media is going to say, it's too late for that. You know, you, you, you can't try to triangulate and take a slightly less pro-life position than everybody else and hope that the media treats you better because of it. They're not. Here's, here's one thing you have to realize as far as the media goes and the left goes. It's, it's a you're either with us or against us mentality. And so if, you're, if you are not identifying as fully pro-abortion in all cases, if that's not what you're saying, then you're getting lumped in with me. I hate to tell you. And they already, there are, they, they draw no distinction between you and me as, as, a, as myself, as a self-proclaimed far-right extremist. Life begins at conception. No exceptions ever for anyone, right? So you're already with me whether you want to be or not in the eyes of the people you're trying to impress. So then why equivocate? I don't want to talk about when life begins. That's, that's the question. That is the question. That's the starting question. You have to be able to answer that. 
Why not answer it? You know what the answer is. It begins at conception. That's the biologically correct answer. No other answer could, makes any sense. Every other answer is arbitrary and unscientific. All right. Um, also on the same issue here, just wanted to quickly mention this, is an article on the um, NPR, on an NPR affiliate website. And the title is, Men Like Me Benefit from Safe Abortion Access. And uh, I forget who the author of this is because I, I copy and pasted it here. I wish I, could, I wish I could tell you the name of the guy who wrote this, but maybe it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, going down a little bit, the article says, men like me have also long been the direct beneficiaries of safe abortion access. Giving women the choice not to carry unwanted pregnancies often means we too can delay parenthood until we are ready. Since I've spent 10 of the past 11 years as a student, most of the women I've had sex with were also students, also progressive, and also not at point in their lives when they were looking or ready to have children. I try to share responsibility for birth control, and if a woman tells me she's on it, I also trust that. If she still got pregnant, however, though entirely her decision, I assume we would both want the same thing, an abortion. In longer terms relationships, we've had explicit discussions about this. It's the duty of both sexual partners to be proactive about safe sex, but in reality, too often this burden falls disproportionately on women. Oh, that's nice. So he's concerned about women too. Admittedly, I've often relied on my female sexual partners to protect me from unwanted pregnancy. During my MBA, I recall panicking in an Uber to the train station after hanging out with a medical student I had met on Tinder and we had seen a few times. She had a latex allergy. We didn't use our best judgment. Then I got her text. She had decided to take plan B as an extra precaution. I was relieved. To my knowledge, I've never gotten anyone pregnant. On an academic level, I followed the entrenched, decades-long conservative effort to undermine access to safe abortions. Yet until this moment, I viewed ex accessible abortion as something my partners and I could reasonably rely on as a last resort. Uh, and then he goes on and on and on, talking about how he really benefits from this. I, I actually... You know, this article provoked, I guess, some uh, mostly jeers and mockery, which is what it deserves. Uh, a little bit of outrage as well on the right. But uh, I'm all about the jeers and mockery for something like this. I'm not outraged at all, in fact. I, I very much appreciate this article, and, 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 I'm, and I'm happy that this guy wrote it. Um, because what he's saying here is exactly correct. This is 100% true. That abortion benefits. It doesn't just benefit. I think it primarily benefits. No, I don't think. It does primarily benefit weak, effeminate, um, limp-wristed, pathetic, loser, lazy, despicable, shameful men like this. They are the beneficiaries of abortion. And so I'm very happy when any of them can stand up and say, yep, that's me, and I, and I love abortion. So that other women can look at this guy and say, like, this, this, is, this is what abortion is for. It's not for you. It's for that guy. This guy who has managed to find multiple sexual partners somehow, which speaks to the collapse of standards um, in our culture today, which is, which is a problem in and of itself. But that's who abortion is for. It's certainly not for women. Because that's the guy who is going to benefit from it, quote-unquote, and will suffer not at all. He pays no price. So he's got no skin in the game um, after the sexual act is complete anyway. He suffers no, he suffers no. Now, if he, if he had a conscience, conscience, you know, if he, if he had a conscience, if he had any kind of moral sense at all, then he would suffer. He would suffer greatly um, from the moral guilt of what he's done. But fortunately for him, he is, as C.S. Lewis would describe him, a man with no chest. He has no conscience. And, uh, and no dignity, no shame, right? And none of that. No, no sense of honor. And uh, he sees other people, especially other women, as just objects to be used as glorified masturbatory aids. And uh, as, as essentially sex, fleshy sex robots is how he sees them. And so abortion is just all about avoiding um, uh, responsibility so that he could continue being irresponsible and using women without ever having to pay any kind of price for that whatsoever. Now, the women, on the other hand, um, th there's, a, there's a very steep cost that they pay physically. Um, there's the physical toll of abortion, which is significant. There's the physical damage that abortion can cause such as potentially making it so you can never have kids again, also significant. 
But then also the guilt and the trauma is much harder for women to escape because they're the ones going through this. You, hear, you might hear from the shout your abortion crowd that, oh, it was great. It was fantastic. You know, I had an abortion and then we went, we went afterwards to Taco Bell. It was just like a, it, was a, it was a day out. You know, it's just like running errands. They talk about it like that, but that's, that's, that's it's not true. That's a rationalization. Only men like this can, tr- can, can really choose to be that flippant about it in real life. So, yeah. He's the primary beneficiary. That's what abortion is all about. It's all for him. Um, also wanted to touch on this quickly. Here's a tweet from, uh, from ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. Do we have this? Do we have this? Here we go. So ADL uh, put up this tweet. It says, as we've told Fox News numerous times, casting a Jewish individual as a puppet master who manipulates national events for malign purposes conjures up longstanding anti-Semitic tropes about Jewish power and contributes to the normalization of anti-Semitism. This needs to be removed. And then it's a cartoon where you see George Soros, and he's got he's the puppet master with the marionettes, and um, and he's got the puppet strings on a DA, and then on on a, on an on a attorney general, and they're holding signs that say defund the police and no bail. And the ADL saying that this is this is anti-Semitic, which we hear this a lot from activist groups like the ADL. Now, but here but here's the problem though. Here's the difference. Um, George Soros, who is the target of this cartoon, Jewish people in general are not the target. And I don't know any Jewish people who would be happy to have George Soros appointed as their representative. I don't know. I mean, you could, you could ask, I, mean, I, I guess I could ask uh, Ben about that, see how he feels. But I'm pretty sure that he doesn't consider George Soros to be his representative. George Soros is just George Soros. And as it happens, George Soros is a puppet master who manipulates national events for malign purposes. That, in fact, is what he is and what he does. George Soros, it is a fact that he has involved himself and injected millions of dollars into local races to appoint uh, especially district uh, left-wing district attorneys all across the country. That is a fact. That is not a conspiracy theory. It's not any kind of theory at all. It is a 100% fact. That George Soros is putting millions of dollars to get these left-wing DAs put in there, and they're the ones who do the bail reform, and they bail out the, uh, the or refuse to prosecute the violent criminals who then go out and commit heinous acts. That's a fact. The idea that you're not allowed to point it out because he happens to be Jewish is just absurd. All right, next, um, Bloomberg has a fascinating story here, and uh, the, the headline is, Giant kites that drag cargo ships across the ocean will be trialed next year as the industry attempts to decarbonize. So this is a great innovation. They're talking about giant kites to, to pull uh, boats across the ocean. And this is, uh, this is the, the new environmentalist sort of innovation. Yeah, you know, it's called a sailboat. All right. And it's, we've had this technology since, oh, about, I think, 4,000 BC. So for about 6,000 years. So the environmentalists have discovered a technology that has existed for 6,000 years. Good job, guys. But you know something, if we're talking about ancient um, technology, ancient forms of maritime travel, the most environmentally friendly form of maritime travel, uh, you know, if we're being inspired by ancient times, are like the Roman galley ships, where you have slaves. You know, you just put some slaves there on the, on the oars and you have them uh, power you across the ocean. Maybe we'll get a look at that. That's envi- that's, that is eco-friendly. It's a very green form of transportation. And I also think we've got our, our prisons are full of uh, people who could be put to better use that way. Something to think about. J- just, you know, f- for the sake of the environment. And uh, finally, the Wall Street Journal reports on a troubling trend. It says, here's the headline, how a $6 Bass Pro Shops hat became a fashion trend. Uh, you don't need to fish to wear this hat. In fact, many of its fans have never touched a fishing pole. You can throw it on with anything, they say. So then it goes on to talk about it. I had no idea that this trend existed. That's how out of the loop I am. But uh, it says, Jesse Alvarado doesn't fish or hunt, and he wouldn't describe himself as an outdoorsy person. But on many mornings, Mr. Alvarado, 25, a restaurant worker in Los Angeles, plops a Bass Pro Shops trucker hat on his head. The mesh-backed cap flashes the name and open-mouth fish logo of the 49-year-old outdoor retailer, which is best known for selling reels and duck decoys. 
to Mr. Alvarado, it's just a good-looking hat. It's a simple design, he said, like you can throw it on with anything. For a variety of reasons, some involve actual fishing. The hats are in demand. And then it goes, this is actually a very, very long article. I didn't realize this at first. This thing's probably like 5,000 words long, just giving examples of people wearing Bass Pro Shops hat, hats, and um, none of them are fishing. So this is what the kids are doing now. And that's why I want to say, my culture is not your damned hat, kids. This is cultural appropriation. Me, as an avid Bass Pro Shops customer and angler as well, I didn't even know. See, like, I am being put on the outside of my own culture because of this. Here's the test. If you can't speak for 15 minutes about your favorite soft plastic fishing lure, and if you don't know the difference between like a Texas rig and a Carolina rig, then you shouldn't be wearing that hat. If you can't even distinguish between a crankbait and a, and a damned spinnerbait, then, 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 then take that hat off your head. And by the way, my favorite uh, form of soft plastic is the green pumpkin trick worm. Um, you used to kind of do a basic Texas rig on there, put a, put a you know, quarter, out, quarter ounce weight on it, bump it around logs and, and weeds and stuff like that. If it's clear weather, clear water, the bite's a little slow, maybe you could do the Sanko green pumpkin. Uh, I like to wacky rig it as well there. But anyway, that's besides the point. What was I saying? Anyway, this is cultural appropriation. And that's the other problem too, because, because usually this is how I can know that someone is in my culture, that they're one of, one of mine, one of my people. Is if I see you know, a Bass Pro shop hat, then I can go up to them and I can start talking about fishing lures. And, that's, and we could talk for an hour about that. It's like one of the only things I can make small talk about. But now I know that if I go up to someone and I say, oh, you like uh, uh, fishing, huh? They're just going to stare at me blankly. This is what cultural appropriation feels like, and it, it does not feel good. Let's get to our comment section. Daily cancellations are the law and order of the day. We're the sweet baby gang. If you're planning on doing uh, some traveling uh, over the holidays, then and you haven't signed up for the Get Upside app yet, then please do that right now, or at least after the show. Go get signed up for this app. Get Upside means that you can make up to 25 cents for every gallon of gas every time you fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use promo code Walsh and get a bonus 25 cents per gallon on your first fill up. So that's up to 50 cents cash back. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using Get Upside. Just download the app for free and use promo code Walsh to get up to 50 cents a gallon cash back on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two or $300 a month in cash back and there's no catch. The cash back gets added right to your account uh, and it's very simple like that. There's no hidden fees or anything. There's no, uh, no red tape you have to worry about. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands as well are available. It's as simple as that. It's easy as that. So just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code Walsh to get up to 50 cents a gallon cash back on your first tank. That's code Walsh with the free GetUpside app. Uh, by the way, if you have not yet... And you are a member of the Sweet Baby Gang, and you haven't yet gone to dailywire.com slash shop and um, gotten some kind of gear, especially as we get into the holiday season, then, uh, then I don't know what you're doing. You know, you're, you're not a true member of the gang unless you're giving me money. That's what cults are all about. So make sure to go to dailywire.com uh, slash shop. Go to uh, our store. We've got all kinds of great... In fact, I had... Oh, here we go. Hang on. So we got, the, we got these great... I like these hoodies here. This one, this is a good one. And this is, if you, if you want to confuse people, that's what really this is all about. We've got the, um, the panda hoodie with the should I exist. <laughs> so you can wear that around and uh, people will very, be very confused. Perhaps even more confused than when you're wearing a, a, you know, a grown man with a beard and a diaper. Okay, John Morey says, don't they have really good air filtration? I'm glad to hear that um, they do. Can I start smoking my pipe on a plane? Or Matt, you might like smoking your cigars. Everybody enjoys that nice aroma. Yeah, that's. I think that's probably why. I always wonder when you get on a plane and they they make this point of um, telling you not to smoke, and they go in this whole speech about don't smoke, don't don't smoke in the bathroom. And I always think that people actually do. When's the last time someone actually did that? They've been doing this disclaimer for like thirty years, and it's probably been thirty years since someone. Someone went into the bathroom on a plane and started smoking a cigarette. I've never seen that happen. I've never heard of it. Um, but back in the day, yeah, I mean, every plane would have smelled like smoke. And you can do it, too, because of the, the air filtration. So I'm very much in favor of going back to a time when every indoor environment reeked of tobacco smoke. 
I'm in favor of that. Especially certain places like bowling alleys. I'm old enough to remember you go into a bo- back in the day, you go into a bowling alley and it's just like it's like stepping into an ashtray. And it sounds unpleasant, maybe it is, but that's part of the bowling alley experience, and I, I long for it. Uh, Seeking Light says, Matt, as a physical therapist and one who has looked into actual studies about how much protection a mask provides, the reason the nose is covered is that uh, aerosol particles from sneezes are propelled further than cough particles. An airplane engineer once told me that cabin air in a passenger jet is replaced something on the order of every two seconds, meaning that your regular breathing in a plane would never allow your expelled air with normal breathing to even reach the person next to you. Yeah, I try, I've tried to explain this to people. I was talking about it on Twitter yesterday. That an airplane, 30,000 feet in the air, is really is the safest place on Earth that you can be in pretty much every way including uh, when it comes to germs. There's not going to be a more sanitized environment that you'll ever find yourself in as a regular person. Every other place, they don't have the same kind of uh, air filtration. They're also pumping ox air in from outside the plane, which is very, very clean air. So, um, But you tell people this, and it, 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 it doesn't, intuitively, it doesn't make any sense to them. And so, especially when that's the case, people are impervious to any kind of data or anything. They don't want to hear it. So intuitively, it just seems like, well, you're, you're trapped in this tin bucket with other people, surrounded by people. This must be really dirty air, and people must be getting sick all the time. It's not true, but good luck trying to convince people of that. Um, Dave says, hands down the greatest daily cancellation. So great that I, after following Daily Wire hosts for years, will now purchase a membership. Well, thank you. You freeloader. Finally becoming a paying member. Sean says, Catholics are not Christians. You cannot mix man-made doctrines with the word of Lord God the Father. Okay, Sean. Well, which Christian denomination do you subscribe to that does not have doctrines written by a human hand? This, this is what always trips me up a little bit when I hear this sometimes from Christians who are not Catholic. And they say, oh, I, I don't want all, all these doctrines. What, if, what, what church are you going to where there are no doctrines that were physically written by human beings? Now, just because a doctrine is written by human beings doesn't mean that it's not, uh, that it doesn't come from God. But that would be my point. That would be my defense of doctrines in the Catholic Church. The Bible was physically written by human beings. Does that mean it didn't come from God? No. But it it was written by human beings. It was, in that sense, man-made. I mean, literally, physically, made by human beings. Um, And so your criticism of Catholicism would seem to... You're setting up logic here that would discard all doctrines and uh, all denominations and all of Scripture. But you apply it Clearly, you apply this logic in a very sort of targeted, someone, some might even say hypocritical way. Um, B-Man R. Cole says, Pickles, commenting pickles until you acknowledge my comment and pronounce my username. Day 107. Have you really been leaving the word pickles under every show for 107 shows? I guess I want to respect your... Consistency, your follow through. I hope that was worth it. All of that build up. You, you've, been, you've been waiting for you know a third of a year, and there you go. I have now said pickles. Um, Techni girl says, Matt, I agree with you on the porn issue, but you're incorrect when you say that 11 year old girls are prepubescent. Many, if not most, girls start puberty around age nine or ten, and by 11, it's in full full swing. I can confirm this as a mother of an 11 year old girl. Anyway, keep up the great work. Nine is when it begins. My daughter is eight. I'm not ready for that. I'm not, I'm not ready for that. Don't, don't tell me those things. Um, and then finally, a couple comments here on the same subject says, Matt, I got to disagree with you on wishing bad outcomes for evil people. Enacting justice is one thing and should be established, but yet to yearn for ill will against another isn't Christian, certainly not good. You either love or you hate and you can't hold a grudge against someone you love. You can't serve both Satan and God. A person who makes you hate them can control you. And I'm not into this whole new age Christianity where one can do no wrong, but to wish someone face hardship makes you no better than them. I wish for people to see the glory of God and his love, not to further succumb to evil acts and desires. Then JD says, it's a good thing to desire the suffering of others for doing evil. 
Love thy enemy as thyself? Turn the other cheek? Is Matt a better authority than Jesus for morality now? Um, that's an easy question. These are all pretty easy questions. The answer is no, I'm not a better authority than Jesus. But also Jesus never said anything that would uh, rule out what I said yesterday, which, which is that we should want evildoers to suffer for their evil deeds. We should want that. And I know with the kind of milk toast um, Christianity that people are so used to these days, the sanitized milk toast Christianity, that sort of thing sounds shocking and kind of uh, and, and, and really sort of startling. But that's only because you've been brought up in this milk toast Christianity. If I were to make that statement that we should wish suffering on those who do evil, if I were to make that to, to statement to any Christian prior to about 100 years ago, they would have looked at me like, yeah, well, yeah, of course. What do you mean? Again, that's, that's, that's all over the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. But, but these, these things are not, are not overturned, are not reversed, are not negated by the New Testament. Uh, Jesus says that himself. He's, he's fulfilling Scripture, not overturning it. So look at it this way. Do you think that evil deeds should be punished? Should a person who commits an evil deed be punished? Let's make this real. Let's take a, let's take a real example. It's unfortunately happened many times in, you know, in society. Uh, someone who commits rape. Okay, a heinous act. Do you think that the rapist should be punished? Do you want the rapist to be punished? And I know that your answer is yes. And so what you're saying is you want the rapist to suffer because that's what punishment is. It is suffering. That's the point of punishment. If it's a punishment where you're not suffering, then it's not a punishment. That is the point of the punishment is to make someone suffer to varying degrees, right? Depending on what the infraction is. If it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a pretty mild infraction, but you still feel that there needs to be a correction, then you're, you're, you know, the, the suffering will be very, very minimal, but it's still, still, still there. Even telling someone to pay a fine is suffering intentionally. But that's what a punishment is. It is suffering intentionally oppo- imposed on someone for the sake of justice, and for their own moral betterment. So in fact, if you love the sinner as we're supposed to, then that's even more reason that you would desire for them to suffer for evil acts. Because it it is for their own moral betterment. It causes them to confront what they've done and the severity of it. And that's the only only hope of reformation, the only hope of, uh, of repentance is through that, is through suffering. Yes, you can, you can wish that people who do evil suffer for those evil. Well, not only was the Daily Wire the first in the nation to sue the Biden administration for their unconstitutional mandates, but we're less than 100,000 away from hitting our goal of 1 million signatures on our Do Not Comply petition. Why? Because people are realizing that uh, if we don't actively fight for our freedom, the government will take it. Reaching 1 million signatures will provide a major boost to our legal challenge. Uh, I didn't know if we would make it to a million because that's... that's, that's Pretty impressive, and very few petitions are able to achieve that. But uh, we're getting there. We're over 900,000 signatures. And if you want to add your name to the list and you haven't yet, go to dailywire.com slash do not comply. Also, if you haven't heard, Ben Shapiro is hosting a new series exclusively for The Daily Wire. It's a voyeuristic view of his conversations with his closest and most influential friends, including Jordan Peterson, who stopped by on a recent trip to Nashville to be his first guest. They um, head to one of Ben's favorite local coffee shops to discuss big ideas and their private lives as if the cameras aren't even rolling, but they are, of course. The premiere episode drops tonight and will be available only on dailywire.com. So if you're not a member yet, you got to become a member. Now's the perfect time to sign up. Head to dailywire.com slash subscribe to sign, to sign up today. Uh, clips of the show will be available on YouTube as well. But if you want the full show, the full experience, go to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. You know, I had planned today to uh, perform a cancellation revolving around a recent incident at an airport. And I'm not exactly sure where this happened, but uh, I wasn't sure at first when I saw this. But it's, a, it's a, a massive fight broke out between two groups of people. And you can see some of the footage here. Now, the reason why I couldn't say for sure where it occurred is that there is, are violent skirmishes of this type at airports every week now. So when you Google airport fight, as I did, the results won't help you narrow things down very much. But it will provide you with hours of entertainment, uh, however, if you're looking for for distraction. Based purely on the exorbitant amount of time I spent at airports, I originally guessed that this is uh, Minneapolis or Chicago. 
not to stereotype, but I also assume that these are spirit or allegiant passengers. In fact, what you're witnessing here is, is actually part of the traditional boarding process for a spirit flight. If you want to board in the first group, you have to defeat the other passengers in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The winner gets to choose their seat. The losers are stuffed in the cargo hold. But as it happens, upon further research, I discovered that this flight did indeed happen. Uh, this fight did indeed happen a couple weeks ago in Minneapolis, though it appears I unfairly impugn the dignity of, uh, the, the dignity of spirit and allegiant. These are, it turns out, frontier customers. So I picked the wrong budget airline. My apologies to Spirit, whose passengers are much too classy to beat the snot out of each other in the airport. They would at least wait until they're on the plane to do that. But the main point here is that these people are stomping the living hell out of one another in the middle of the terminal, right near a TSA checkpoint, even using trash can lids and other objects as weapons. And notice how nobody is intervening. Now, consider the fact that, that I cannot walk five steps through an airport without getting yelled at for not wearing a mask. And yet these folks can stage a WWE match over by gate 12. And at no point does anyone in airport security even so much as politely ask them to stop. If I tried to walk through security with my belt still on, let's say, I'd be like tased and hogtied and molested by a man in rubber gloves. But they can commit a series of felony assaults on one another in an airport. And there are no repercussions at all. There were no arrests after this incident either, by the way, if you can believe it, which I'm sure you can. No, nobody was arrested for that. They were not stopped from doing it. They weren't even yelled at. And no one was arrested. White privilege takes some very strange forms, you must admit. See, we're told that systemic racism is so severe that black individuals are murdered by police for the slightest infractions. And yet, you watch a video like this, or, or so many videos like it, and you see violent crimes committed in the open, on camera, without police even showing up to stop it, let alone spraying bullets everywhere, as the media claims would happen. So there appears to be a disconnect between narrative and reality, as always. That, anyway, was going to be the subject of the cancellation today, and I guess partially it still is, since I've spent half the segment talking about it. But this is a, is a Friday, and I have to try to squeeze everything in before the weekend. And so at, at the last minute, I happened to see a clip of Joy Reid, which was so egregious but I changed my mind and I decided that I needed to cancel her instead today. She's already a member of this prestigious club of multiply canceled people on the Matt Wall Show. And now she can add another one to the tally. Because a couple of days ago, Joy Reid took to her MSNBC show that nobody ever sees except when clips of it are shared on Twitter to make fun of her. And she attacked uh, noted African-American Elon Musk for criticizing Elizabeth Warren. We don't have to rehash the dispute between Musk and Warren. The most relevant point for our purposes today is that Musk called Warren Senator Karen. Okay, calling her a Karen, Senator Karen. And that provoked this from Reed. Well, Elon wasn't happy, so he did what he always did and stomped his little feet and insulted Senator Warren, calling her an angry mom and referring to her as Senator Karen. So for so many reasons, being a freeloader and a selfish and disrespectful one and for misappropriating black vernacular for misogynistic purposes, Elon Musk is the absolute worst. Meanwhile, Senator Warren has better things to do than fight with Junior Birdman on Twitter. Now, I want you to think about this because we have here from Joy Reid multiple degrees of hypocrisy and anti-white bigotry layered on top of each other in a bewildering, almost inception-like way. So as I've argued in the past, and Reid herself confirms here, really, Karen is a racial slur that black people use against white people. The insult began on social media, primarily among black people, to refer to a certain type of white woman that they don't like. Now, when members of one race come up with a derogatory term to describe members of another race, that is a racial slur by definition. Now, I know there are a lot of kind of stupid, self-hating white people who, who recoil at this. There's even a lot of white people who say, it's not a racial slur. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, they, they themselves will valiantly defend the rights uh, the, of other people to, to slur them. But th that's what it is. I'm telling you, that's where it comes from. This is one group of people from, from, a, from a certain race came up with a, a derogatory term for members of another race they don't like. That is a racial slur. There is no getting around it. Again, Reed acknowledges this. And yet she says that, that it's, it's racist for white people to use it, for them to use an anti-white racial slur because they're appropriating the term from black culture. And black people, she says, are the only ones who have the right to insult white people in that way. Suddenly, in one amazing, death-defying move of mental gymnastics, Reed has made black people into the victims of a racial slur used by black people against white people. 
Now compare this, of course, with other slurs used against other groups of people, which were then reclaimed by the targeted group so that now they are the only ones who are allowed to say them. You know, think about that. But white people are not welcome to do the same thing with slurs that target them. Shut up, whitey, and let us insult you, Joy Reid says. This is the kind of thing that makes anti-white racism not only um, the, the only sort of racism that exists in the country. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's rather not the only sort of racism that exists in the country. Of course, there are always going to be racist people of all races directing their ire out to other groups. Okay, so that exists across the board. There are white racists, there are black racists, there are Asian racists, and so on. But anti-white racism is the most dangerous form of racial bigotry in the country today by far because it's the only form that is socially acceptable. Joy Reid can sit in front of a camera on national television and openly defend an anti-white racial slur, claim it as her own, as part of her culture, and there are no penalties of any kind. It's hardly even noticed. Joy Reid is herself a raging, drooling, white-hating bigot, and she makes no effort whatsoever to hide it. She doesn't need to. There are no professional or social consequences for her, for her form of racism, which is what makes it so uniquely dangerous and will lead and is leading to very dark places. And that's why she today is finally canceled. And also Minneapolis Airport Security are canceled as well, for the record. And we'll leave it there for today and the week. Have a great weekend. Talk to you on Monday. Godspeed. The Matt Walsh Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodosky. The show is edited by Ali Hinkle. Our audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. And our production coordinator is McKenna Waters. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. Hey, everybody. This is Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon's turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the fall of the republic with me, Andrew Claven. <laughs>